How many people weren't really expecting to see that? It's an alien. Yeah, okay, so this is that, this is so unique. This was different for Harley Davidson here on this balanced motor. I'm gonna go get these parts and I'll bring them over here and set them apart disassembled. Our whole main goal was we were just going to uh, explain and see how to get into the, you know, into the engine cases here. To continue on with this, it's nothing that's uh, super difficult or super hard. Remember how we had that oil screen when we had the cam support plate that we pulled out? And I said was different for the twin cam motor. Well, that filters oil that goes to these hydraulic tensioners because oil pressure goes in here, pushes up on this, and that what puts the tension on the on the chain here. Here's the thing about all this: this all has alignment to it. Okay, so I'm going to show you that in a second here. I just want to talk about the different components. So now underneath here, okay, inside of here, now you can see what's back behind there. This counterbalancer, right? So this is supported in each case half, and then this is bolted on. You can see our rear here. And what I want you to notice here is this arrow. You see that? Okay, so we have an arrow here. Okay, let's go ahead and keep on looking at the other side. You can see another arrow here. Okay, and then you also see how this chain has these three dark links. Take a look at this. You can see these different links. Well, when you set this to the right position, I'm going to go ahead and see if I can do that on this motor here. The service manual is going to tell you, well, eventually, when you go to time it and everything's loose, this goes together really easy. I'm just going to fast forward this here. You don't have to do this step, but it is nice to do just to prove that the last person did time it correctly. You could address issues of excessive vibration or be able to just know that it was timed correctly for your records. times you have to rotate that. Yeah. Were you guys starting to think that the last person assembled it wrong? Yeah. Right? And I remember the very first time I did this, I thought same thing. I'm like, holy cow, wow, these are way off in left field. But you got to remember, when everything's loose on the bench, back up to this, when this is all this, when this is loose on the bench, the service manual is going to tell us to do something particular with this crankshaft and put it in a certain position, the mark is covered up right now. We can't see it. So they'll tell you to have that in the down position. You're going to take one of those three links and you're going to engage it on the mark there. You're going to wrap the chain around with the front mark here and this arrow pointing <coughs> off to the side. You're going to put that link on there. This will come down along here. You put the matching one over here and the crankshaft is going to be timed correctly with the counterbalancers. How you doing? Make sense there? Oh, yeah. yep. Alright, let's take a look at our plate here. We can see here, these are those plungers here that are going to hold tension on that, uh, on that assembly. Uh, assembly of this is pretty crucial though. I want you to notice here that feed hole. Okay, That feed hole like you see in this plate here, this extra one, that's what supplies oil to those tensioners. And if they don't get enough oil, what's that chain going to do? The oil goes through here and through this casted area and that's what pushes the piston up. So if there, once again, if there isn't oil here, these won't be allowed to put tension on the chain. Now let me ask you again, what's going to happen? It'll knock it out of What? Knock it out. Could knock it out of time, could jump teeth, would it get really noisy? Yep. Yeah. Customer guns on it and says, hey, I got this crazy rattling coming, you know, from my engine. And it's literally that this chain tensioner isn't working and is slapping around and it's going to be uh, the problem. Let's take a look at the matching crankcase. All right, you remember in class I was talking about how the oil gets returned back to the pump and then it goes uh, to the tank or to the filter depending on the model? And remember you talking about how the flywheel rides really close in here and we have a thing that we consider like a knife edge? Yep. Yeah. So as this crankshaft, you know, rotates around here because this is in here like this. Okay, so this goes this direction. Okay, that oil <coughs> I 
the oil catches right here, scraping off the excess. Okay, it scrapes off that excess. And as it's scraped off there, it goes through here. And I'm going to flip this case around again. And it comes back out that hole with that O-ring that I pointed out earlier in the disassembly. Okay? And then that gets sucked back up into what we call the return side of the oil pump. From the return side of the oil pump, that's going to pump it up to, uh, I believe on this one, it pumps it to the tank, but I have to look at the routing to make sure. Is this starting to all make sense that it's all just about pathways and the flow? Scrape that oil off there, not allow it to puddle up here. Why do I not want oil in here? Because it drags. I want oil to go do its job, but I want it out of there. I do not want this filling up with oil because that's going to slow the crankshaft down. It's going to take horsepower. Let's go ahead and we're going to focus on something that was different about the twin cam as well, and that's these, these piston jets. What we got is those are called piston jets. So as the crankshaft, you have to back up. If the crankshaft is moving up and down here, what we do is we're actually shooting oil out of these up onto the underside of the piston. And the other thing that you'll notice is this is at about this angle. What side of the piston is it shooting at? The uh, exhaust. The exhaust side, the hotter side of that piston. So it's actually coming underneath here and shooting oil at this because that hot oil is colder than this piston temperature to help cool it down. And on the rear cylinder, you see it goes the other way and it shoots backwards. Okay, so we have piston jets on this. This is high tech. I mean, this is something that's great about this engine. And you can see here that in that assembly, okay, go ahead and see how that shoots up underneath there? Yep. Yep. All right, cool. All right, hold that case for me. Appreciate it. All right. Let's see, is there anything else in here that I want to talk about? This, this is something that needs to be thought about right here. Remember the O-ring on the, on the balancer plate? When you put this to, that assembly to, uh, together, that's what that O-ring's going into. You want to make sure that it didn't stick on there when you go to take it apart, okay? Guys, we're not going to take and pop bearings out. Uh, I mean, popping, it, removing and installing bearings, you can see in some of our two-stroke videos, the, the every mechanic should know as far as bearing assembly and disassembly is realistically in a service manual. They're very specific about some types of specialty tools. But would you agree that this is probably all done with a press? Yeah. Okay. Would you agree it's probably done with a tool or a die that's the exact diameter? Yep. Absolutely. Another thing I want to point out is everything's precision aligned, right? Do you guys notice the dowel pins? Okay, so like I said, anytime we want to precisely align something, how many dowel pins? Two. At least Minimum two. of two. And did you notice how they were O-ringed? So they're taking that extra step to put some uh, seal around there. Here's a great training aid I use that uh, does a really good job of showing uh, how the counterbalancers are positioned in relationship to the crankshaft or flywheel. Take a look at some actual parts up next. All right, guys, we're going to try and do our best here to explain and kind of do a demonstration here on counterbalancers and what this looks like. And what I wanted to show was you could see the part of the flywheel here that's sticking out, or it's the weight of the flywheel. It kind of turns sideways. You can see how it's thicker here. And then if you look at the shape of this counterbalancer, do you see how it has that half moon shape? And then you see the half moon shape in here. So what I've done is I've just taken a flywheel, and this X'd out mark here or whatnot is supposed to represent the uh, the heavy part of the flywheel and now you'll see how it works as we go ahead and rotate this so at top dead center you can see the rods would be all the way high because there's the crank pin the weight is at the bottom and we have the weights at the bottom i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to rotate this 90 degrees and they will rotate theirs and what you're going to notice is you've got all this weight that flung out here and the counterbalancers counter or throw that weight to the other direction so as the piston's starting to try and come down here you can see where the rod would be. It's going to put force over here, and it's countering that weight and to, to balance it out the best it can. It's not going to be perfect balance, but it's going to be better. So let's keep going through. I go another 90 degrees, and what you'll notice is this shape 
matches this shape of the counterbalancer here. Once again, real quick, you can see it's at the top here. And then let's do the next 90 degrees. You're going to see that it's going to be now our counterweights on this side and our balancers are opposite here. And then we'll go ahead and go full cycle. We go back down to the bottom here, top dead center, and you'll see the weights match this again. That's how the counterbalancers work.